As a family, they were infamous in their day, and certainly their demise remains among the most notorious crimes of 19th century Ontario. Known as the Black Donnellys, their story has been told many times in the past 140 years, but never in quite the way that Keith Ross Leckie's new novel does. It's called Cursed, Blood of the Donnellys, and it brings Keith Ross Leckie to our studio. So good to meet you. Good to meet you. Sir. This was a wonderful book, I gotta say. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed it. It's quite a rollicking story. A rollicking is a good way <laughs> to put it, yeah. Now, you know, for people who've lived in the province of Ontario for a long time, they will know the story of the Donnellys from outside London, Ontario, in Lucan. But, you know, I'm, I, for those who haven't lived here for a long time, they may not know anything about it. So give us the basic outline of who the Donnellys were. The Donnellys were uh, the, the matriarch and patriarch were Jim and Joanna, who came from Tipperary, Ireland, uh, during the years of the famine and uh, political trouble and rebellion and turmoil. And they, uh, Jim was basically thrown off his land. And uh, they came as uh, teenagers, basically, to Canada and uh, began to homestead. But they were, um, they were basically refugees. And uh, I think... In these days, with uh, more numbers of refugees in the world than there's ever been before, it's an interesting thing to go back and study Jim and Joanna and the Donnellys as refugees, uh, basically the, the, the Syrians of the 1840s. Huh. How did they end up outside London, Ontario? Um, well, there was, uh, it was through word of mouth that a lot of the people from Tipperary were headed to southern Ontario and the London area. And London had been bought up basically by uh, the English and the Scots. And so the Irish were um, pushed north into less fertile lands, but not bad lands, and they could make a go of it up there. How, now they were Catholic. They were. And they had to deal with a mostly Protestant province of Ontario back then. How did that That's work true. itself out? The, the courts and the government were uh, Scots and British, so uh, non-Catholic. And uh, they were... Um, they had a, a tough go of it. The Catholics, uh, they, they became defensive. They were, um, there was St. Patrick's Church in Lucan, which is very strong, a very uh, center of the Catholic community, um, in defense of themselves because the, the English and the Scots and um, other people in power uh, could, could dominate, and so the Irish had to stick together and, and sort of fight back where they had to. And what businesses were they in? The Donnellys, uh, uh, they, they began as homesteaders, and uh, they grew crops and so on. Uh, later on, they got into horse trading and uh, um, studying services and uh, stagecoach business. Mm. Now, they weren't pussycats either, right? I think we can say that. <laughs> no. And maybe you could help fill in some of the blanks that our viewers and listeners may have about why the community ultimately turned so murderously, um, had such murderous animosity towards them? Well, it's a good question. Uh, it, it is important to point out, um, a lot of people don't know, that the people that uh, uh, went that night to their two homesteads and killed everyone they could and burned them to the ground, they were Catholics as well. And what happened was the Donnellys, when they left, first of all, they left Tipperary. Tipperary, the county of Tipperary in Ireland, was considered the most unruly and crime-ridden of the counties of Ireland at the time. And when they came to Lucan, even in the years that the, the Donnelly parents came to Lucan, Lucan was considered the, the roughest town in Ontario. There were fights every night, and it was, there was a lot of strife. Uh, the Donnellys had been portrayed as as monsters, as uh, criminal, violent criminals. And there's a reason for that that I'd, I'd like to mention. But, um, and certainly they were no angels. They were uh, seven boys. They were pretty good looking. They had money in their pockets because of their prosperity. They, uh, they were womanizers and dancers and partiers and drinkers and fighters. And they were an intimidating bunch. But the, the difference is, the reason that they were prosperous is that they did business both on the stagecoach line and with, uh, with the horse trading uh, with Protestants. And that was frowned upon. Uh, and they were, they were condemned for that from the pulpit at St. Patrick's in Lucan by uh, John Connolly, the priest, Father John Connolly. Hmm. And he, um, 
uh, pointed them out and said, you know, the hellfire will consume you. And there was a real, um, because they were, it, I mean, you could say, yes, they were no angels, but they were progressive in terms of not wanting to take the old feuds of Tipperary to, mm -hmm. to Ontario. We should, I, I'm just thinking, we should mention as well, I mean, the boys were hellraisers and they got into their share of trouble and yes, they, they got into their share of fights and, you know, and there, there was killing and, okay, there was all of that. But the woman who was sort of the head of this household, who was trying her best, especially when, you know, her husband had to go into hiding for a long time. Yes. Because the authorities were after him. She's sort of the one who, who basically kept it all together for many years. Yeah, she's... Talk she's, to us about her. Well, she's, she's an iconic figure, a female figure that uh, is really at the heart of this whole story. She um, uh, came over with, with Jim and, you know, was in the dirt uh, um, uh, creating a farm mm. and out of nothing. This was raw wilderness and they had to cut the trees and haul them away and, you know... Uh, burn the branches and open up the fields. Um, an incredible story of survival when they had almost nothing to start with. And in the meantime, she was having uh, eight children, seven boys and one daughter, Jenny, poor Jenny, who uh, no boy in the region would date because his, her brothers would beat them up. So <laughs> she was lovelorn for a long time. But um, so these, uh, she, Joanna brought up all of these kids. And what had happened was Jim was accused and convicted of murder uh, very early on when the kids were just born, when they just, the kids were every year, they would have another child. And uh, just when they were, when she was pregnant with Jenny, Jim, uh, Jim was convicted of murder and went on the run for a year. Which I have to say, you describe in excruciatingly gory detail in the book. <laughs> You really do, the, you go there. The, the killing of Pharaoh? Yes. Yes, yes. Well, it's, it's true that there was a rage that Jim lived with, yeah. and it was manifested there in the killing of Pharaoh. Hmm. But, uh, but I find it interesting that for a year, Joanna supported him and, you know, would have the kids bring him food in the woods. He lived in the woods, and he kept operating his farm. Uh, he would go out and, and work the crops, work the farm, for a full year, and the, the constables would come and try to catch him, and they almost did a couple of times. They, mm. they shot at him twice, and he would run away, and he knew his farm and he knew his woods, so he could keep away from them, and he always had a fast horse close. But the, an interesting image is that he used to put on Joanna's dress to go out into the field and uh, hoe weeds or whatever, or plant seeds. Um, so they would, you know, neighbors would see this rather sturdy looking figure in a woman's dress out uh, working the field. I have to say, I find your treatment of this story to be very fresh and original. And <clears throat> and I had a hard time putting the book down. But it's not like this story hasn't been told before, right? This is the subject of books and movies and plays and, 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 and lots of storytellers have gone here in the past. So I do wonder what made you think you had something kind of new to bring to the table for this. I've always been attracted by the Donnelly story. When I was 11 years old, my father, who was a teacher, um, had, had grown up in a farmhouse just west of London and knew the Donnelly story well. So he took me when I was 11 to uh, Lucan, to the general store, and, uh, and started asking questions about the Donnellys. And I remember the proprietor said, we don't talk about the Donnellys. And so there was Still. This, well, this was 40 years ago. Oh, all right. Or more, but... Uh, um, but there was that tension, and as a kid, I, I said, what is all this about? So the story has really interested me all the way through. And I do have a theory that, um, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll go into, but I, the reason that I wanted to rewrite this is it's a beautiful, big, epic story that, that begins in Tipperary, Ireland, and goes through to uh, the, the years of creating this family and the strife with the other townspeople and the, uh, the massacre itself, and then the murder trial afterwards. There were, the, the trial itself is fascinating. And it's kind of a joke, wasn't it? Well... Maybe that's the, not the right word to use, but it doesn't seem like justice really prevailed. Well, here's, here's my theory, is that uh, at the very beginning, there, uh, the place was just inundated with press from the States, from, uh, from Canada. Um, they were fascinated by this massacre. It was... A, at a level of public interest that rivaled the, uh, the assassination of Lincoln mm. uh, at the time. 
And so the, the press was trying to find out what was going on. There was a great deal of sympathy for the Donnellys at that point. But then there were seven, six men arrested, and they, were stand, uh, they had charges against them for murder. And if they were convicted, they would all hang. These were the heads of households in the Lucan area. And so uh, at the beginning, though, there, there was sympathy for the Donnellys. But later in the trial, as the, as the months went on, there began to get, develop a sympathy for the, uh, for the vigilantes, for the, the killers, mm. basically. And there was overwhelming evidence that they were the men that had done this. And there was even charges being, there were charges being prepared that if they were convicted, there were more people that were going to be charged with, with uh, being part of this mob of 40 vigilantes. So it would have devastated the town had they been convicted and, and hanged. So the church was very involved because the church was implicated in the, uh, the actions of the vigilantes. I'm, I'm sure that the priest never thought it would go that far. But uh, there's documented evidence of him speaking against the Donnellys, setting up the, what was called the Peace Society, began as the Peace Society and making people sign. Uh, and everybody signed in the congregation except the Donnellys. So the church was implicated, and the government did not want to destroy the community. So the outcome of the trial was not guilty for these six men. And the, um, the, the court pronounced that the Donnellys were killed by parties unknown. Mm. It was the final rendition of their finding. You know, as I read the trial, proceedings in your book, I just couldn't help but think, the fix is in. We well, know what the outcome's going to be. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting, because I do believe, and in the book it comes out, that at the beginning, they start out with uh, eyewitness accounts, Johnny O'Connor, wonderful character, 11-year-old kid. Can, and, I re can I read something about him? Oh, Let sure. me do a quote, because you've got, you've got little Johnny here with a quote. Sheldon, let's bring this graphic up. She shouts at them, you cowards, you're all damned to hell. I'll see you there. Finally, Jim Carroll raised a club and brought it down on Johanna's head. Johanna fell to her knees. Mr. Jim and Tom both pulled away from their attackers and tried to protect Johanna. Then the vigilantes used their clubs under the swinging light. I tried to open the upstairs door, but I gave it up and scrambled down the stairs again, crossed the floor, and went back into the bedroom. It was as if I were invisible, for no one seemed to lay eyes on me, in that if they did and properly thought to kill me as a witness, I were surely gone. Did I do an okay Irish accent at the end there? <laughs> Not bad, 11-year-old. <laughs> anyway, this poor, yeah, this, this poor little kid is there on the night and witnesses the massacre. Right. Yikes. And, and his testimony was consistent. He had to give it many times. Mm. And it was very consistent in terms of his moves, who was doing what to whom. And, uh, you know, I put that in the book as accurately as I could. Well, let me raise that. Uh, of course, when you read a book like this, uh, you're wondering, now, it, is this true, or is this true, or is he playing with the, the facts here, or is he taking liberties here? Did you have a, an internal barometer as to what you might use poetic license with and what you wanted to be very strict on the facts with? Yes. Well, I've been, I, I'm always attracted by true stories. I've, I've done a lot of movies and uh, miniseries and so on, like the Avro Arrow and the Halifax Explosion. And I, I love big, uh, epic Canadian stories. And uh, this, is, this is certainly one. But I do have a line in the sand. I, I do start with the facts. I want to dramatize the story and start with the facts. Um, and I do have a line I, I don't like to cross. Uh, important things like the massacre itself is extremely accurate to the court records uh, and, and the testimony that was given. Um, there are a number of other episodes that, if I can, I will stick to the facts. But sometimes you have to adjust things a little bit for dramatic uh, and retaining um, possibilities. And, and I'll give you one example. Um, there were two boys, two of the sons, Robert, no, sorry, two of the sons, James uh, and uh, Michael, the horseman and womanizer, and James, the, uh, the alcoholic uh, arsonist. <laughs> um, they did, they were killed in uh, a certain period of time before the massacre. But I wanted to have a build-up to the massacre, a su successful one, and I wanted them to be included. And the, the, the things that led to the massacre uh, also included their murders. So what I did was I moved it. I moved their deaths, even though their deaths were uh, uh, weeks or even months before the massacre, 
I moved it up just to before the massacre to to just give that build that that uh, dramatic build up to when they uh, when the massacre occurs. So that's poetic license. And that was probably the biggest thing I did in terms of changing story structure. Hmm. In our uh, remaining couple of minutes here, tell me this: Are there are there any Donnelly descendants still around? Will Donnelly? Um, I don't know if it was by their design, but. Uh, they, they sort of uh, disappeared. And now there are two. There's the great-grandson of Will Donnelly and the great-grandson of Michael. Uh, sorry, not Michael. Um, Patrick. That they, they were two of the survivors of the Donnelly clan. Ever talked to them? Uh, no, no. Well, I really only found out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it came out through the, the museum in Lucan. You've got to want to meet them, I assume. Well, yeah, I would, I would love that. But the museum in, there's a strange thing that's happened to the museum in Lucan. And Lucan is where, you know, the, the Donnellys battled the Flanagans and the Reagans and, you know, on the main street there outside the central hotel. Um, I went for a reading there at the library and I had a great turnout. But um, the, uh, uh, the, the museum has... There was a defensiveness, this defensiveness that I talked about when I was a kid and uh, felt it. And the Chamber of Commerce and the museum and, you know, the city fathers or the town, town fathers have kind of decided to embrace the Donnellys and, and not, not be defensive. So they're much more open. The museum talks about the massacres, talks about the vigilantes. And many of the vigilantes, um, their descendants at least, still live in the town. And several of them came up, came up to me after my reading and said, we like what you did with the book. And, I, huh. and these are, you know, the, these are the same names as, as the people that were charged with the murders of the Donnellys. Mm. So I felt, I don't know, the book uh, kind of uh, was uh, uh, vindicated my efforts uh, that they would come up and do that. And, and it, just in keeping with the embracing of the Donnelly story in Lucan, which is a great little town, beautiful town, and very warm and friendly now, I find, is there, um, they've got Black Donnelly Ale and Black Donnelly Stout. <laughs> you can go across to the Roadhouse from the library and uh, MJ's Roadhouse. And, you know, now they're getting into inspired Donnelly foods like Joanna's Hot Wings, you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, with Roman lion sauce. And they're, they're kind of, uh, I like to see that. I think it's a, a fresh new take on the Donnellys. And the museum is is terrific on the main street if Great. anybody wants to see. And it all happened 140 years ago yesterday. Yes. Amazing. That's amazing. Can we do one last thing before we say goodbye? Sure. You got a tattoo I can see? Yes, I have a tattoo. And this goes back to the idea of uh, taking true stories and dramatizing them and, you know, trying to stick to the, the facts, uh, trying to tell the truth. Show it to that camera over there, if you would, please. <laughs> OK, well, this is, this is what I do. Um, should I... Uh, Read it if you would, sure. Sure. It says here, it's a quote by Mark Twain. And it says, everything here is absolutely true, except what isn't. <laughs> and it should have been. <laughs> That's a great quote. That's <laughs> a great quote. And you obviously love it so much that it's going to be a permanent part of you. Well, it's what I do. It's what you do. That's why I'm not a journalist. I'm a dramatist. So uh, I, uh, I, I, do, I do move the facts around, but I try to stick to the truth. Perfect. Uh, Keith, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed the book. It was just great. Well, I think I actually already have told you how much I enjoyed the <laughs> book, so maybe I can. Cursed, Blood of the Donnellys is what it's called, and we're glad it's brought you to our studio tonight. Thanks so much. Well, it's been a great pleasure, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> the Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.